Hello, everyone. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Iris. We're waiting for Mary to come on. Hello, Matt. Hi, Pat. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Sorry, I didn't mean to say something just as you were taking a bite. <laughs> That's fine. Um, uh, we're, um, it is the lunch and learn after all, so we get to lunch and learn. So <laughs> wouldn't be that without the food. Hey, Pat. <laughs> Hi, Mary. How are you? I I'm owe you an email. <laughs> oh, yes. An email. Whenever you get around to it. Um, but it was uh, nice. I got so many nice emails from volunteers that like, it was. Yeah. Really you got a few other things to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no big deal. Um, this, uh, uh, there's always a million things going on, but never too many things going on to, to make sure that we um, take care of our volunteer family. <laughs> You're very kind. Well, you, you and all of you all have given us so much that um, we, we're, we're in debt, so we got to make sure we pay at least <laughs> a part of it back. <laughs> I just make sure that I've got my thing ready to go. Okay. Do you have a PowerPoint today, Mary? I do, not as um, in depth as some of the other ones, but uh, some good talking points uh, to, to keep me on track. <laughs> yeah, cool, that's awesome. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, and then I have positioned myself here in front of the drawers in case I wanted anybody had wanted me to pull anything out while we were talking. Nice. Um, I have um, got most of them unscrewed, so it should be a pretty easy process um, to do it. If anybody you know wants to look at anything in particular. Mm -hmm. Cool. We'll have to see if anyone from the ASV shows up with the Archaeology Month. Yeah. I didn't tell you, Mary, um, we get, we'll have a little mini staff meeting. It'll be interesting for other people to hear this too. Uh, Encyclopedia Virginia is coming back to scan Montpelier on Friday. Oh, cool. And so they're going to scan the whole house. The last time they scanned was in 2000 and 13, I think. It's when Betsy was an intern because she was, you can see Betsy in the lab, she was scanned. So she, Betsy was an intern still when I first got here. So that was 2015. So it would have been 2014 or 15. Yeah, then it was 2014. Yeah, it was, it, should, it was right after her field school. Um, and, uh, but they're also going to scan the South Yard, which is really cool. And then the Gilmore Cabin. Which very they have not cool. done yet, which is great. Very cool. Well, I've got um, several Gilmore artifacts in this presentation. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it all connects. Well, part of the way through, you'll have to ask if anybody has heard about this from ASV, Mary. Day. Oh, from, from Archaeology Month? Yeah, this, uh, so we could report back to Laura on that. Yeah, I think because it, it went on the um, 
their ca the calendar for the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad you think this is new. <laughs> Brand new. <laughs> Come on, Mark. <laughs> That's a nice sunroom you have, Matt. <laughs> we um, I built this back in 2005. It's one of the first big projects in the house. Very nice. I, I enclosed it before I tore out the wall that was right here. So. <laughs> I have pictures of Cole and Tess when they were very tiny climbing around the uh, construction project. <laughs> Boy, that puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's called adventure play. <laughs> <laughs> Morning. I feel very satisfied with spending lunchtime with you guys because I, all of a sudden, I'm starting to see things I didn't know existed until you started showing me various types of holes to dig in the ground. And um, there was a whole big article about um, the first black church in Williamsburg, and they're excavating all sorts of things. And I said, I recognize all that stuff. Awesome. <laughs> well, can't wait to have you out here, Mark, once all this I, clears. I, I can't wait either, so. <laughs> We've got the 2021 program list for the spring and the fall ready, and we're going to be, Sarah Lee's going to be sending out an email either this weekend or next weekend with all those dates and be able to reserve a space on the website, so. Excellent. Well, we'll shoot for next fall, I think. That's, that's what we're doing. We're hoping that next fall we'll things will be a little more in control, hopefully with the vaccine and be able to have a, um, a little bit more relaxed time doing these expeditions. But the three we ran this, this fall worked well. A social distancing, everyone followed it and we're, did everything outside. Um, but yeah, it's, everybody has a different comfort level, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So I see a bunch of people are hopping on now. We're going to give it a, a couple, or we're right now at 12 o'clock. Um, so I wanted to kind of introduce a little bit about what we're going to talk about today, but also kind of um, for those of you who have been on some of these, particularly ones with me before, some of it's gonna follow sort of a similar format, but we're gonna go in a little bit of a different direction. And for those of you who maybe this is your first time or you've done ones with Matt or <clears throat> Terry or somebody else, <clears throat> this is this is gonna kind of fall in a little bit of a different track. So um, we decided this month to hold this um, Lunch and Learn and then Matt's Lunch and Learn, which is next week, which is gonna focus on um, Francis Madison. Um, because the theme for Archaeology Month in Virginia is about um, women in archaeology. And um, we wanted to kind of dive into that theme and, and sort of hop into what they were celebrating. And for those of you who don't know, every state around the country has an Archaeology Month um, that's run usually out of the, the State Historic Preservation Office with the state archaeologists. Um, and supported by the different avocational groups and museums and institutions throughout the state. And special events are done during that month to really highlight the archeology span that's going on in that state. So if you live in Virginia, be sure to check out, you know, you're on a computer right now, Google Virginia Archeology span Month, because there's gonna be a whole bunch of other things besides just Montpelier's talks, but from different talks, different experiences from archeologists all over the state going on for the rest of the month. And you still have a couple of weeks left of, of Virginia, uh, of Virginia Archeology span Month, which is October. Um, if you don't live in Virginia, check out your own state. <laughs> um, uh, March is I believe Florida Archeology span Month. Yeah, March is Florida Archeology span Month. That's one I spent a lot of time doing events for <laughs> um, back in the day. 
but uh, you can always just Google whatever your state is, Archaeology Month, and you will always find lots of information. There's usually websites with calendars on them pointing you in the direction of generally a lot of free um, events, lectures, talks, sometimes there's festivals, depending on the, on the year. Um, and every year there's a theme. And every year there is a poster that gets made for each Archaeology Month. And then um, at our annual conventions, the archaeologists all compete with which state has the best poster every year. So some of the posters are really quite amazing and they, they, they show the theme. So um, for those of you that, you know, maybe are interested in archaeology but didn't know that this was a possibility, this is a, a great thing to kind of just keep on your radar. So Virginians mark October is the most important month. It's archaeology month. It's my birthday month. You know, Halloween's <laughs> coming. The leaves are changing. The weather's perfect. This is this is the time. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, to let you all know that a little bit ahead of time. Um, and did anybody? I was just say, is anybody on here? You can either give a thumbs up or or a wave or something like that if you saw this on the Archaeology Month calendar or knew about Archaeology Month. Maybe. All right. We got two pages of people, so yay, two pages of people. Um, so for those of you who have done some of these lunch and learns with me in the past, usually uh, my little mini series within this series is called, Do You Know What This Is? And I do a deep dive into a particular artifact type. And usually I start those, those talks with sort of how I identified those artifacts and um, some resources. And so when I started thinking about how do we see women in the archaeological record, my brain sort of returned to that format. So we're going to follow it a little bit, but um, I'm going to lean pretty heavy into some of my favorite resources. Um, and really the ones, I wouldn't say that they're, uh, these are ones that have particularly shaped me as an archaeologist and as, as a woman in archaeology and how I understand both um, women in archaeology and how we understand women in the past through archaeology. So there are a ton of amazing um, archaeologists that I am not going to touch on in this talk that have written really, really pivotal things, but these are just um, some that really kind of hit home for me at different points in my career, and I'm going to kind of use them as the framework. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and Let's see, start with this. All right. So I, I kind of changed the title a little bit um, to Discovering Women in the Archaeological Record again, because as I started thinking about this, I wanted to sort of shift the way I constructed it. Um, and so usually when I do these, these, do you know what this is? I always start with tools you'll need. And they're usually things like a magnet or your, your fingernails. But really to understand women in the archeological record, you need some um, to change your way of thinking. And that sounds sort of strange, but you need to kind of come at this with an open mind and a willingness to ask new and different questions. Um, and the desire to look at the same old thing in a new way. Um, and the ability to, to avoid assumptions of gender from our own culture and our own time period. So there's a lot of things that are so ingrained in us that we just assume that there are certain jobs that, oh, that's a, of course something is what a woman would do or not do or wear or not wear. Um, you know, there's so many wonderful examples of that through time, but like high heels were actually invented for men to wear and most people don't know that. So I think it's really important that we kind of drop our own assumptions. And then the biggest uh, uh, tool you're gonna need are references. So there are so many amazing references. And like I said, I'm gonna kind of dive into a couple here that, that really have changed my way of thinking. But um, so starting with some of my favorite resources, this is actually a book. Um, uh, it's an edited volume called Women in Archaeology and it covers archeological archeological excavations and women archeologists from throughout time and across the world. Um, so many different time periods um, of women exploring all different types of archeological sites. And the reason I wanted to start with this book is I think it's really important to understand the history of women as archeologists to understand how women in the past have been interpreted through archeology. span um, For a long time, men were the ones doing the digging, men were the ones doing the asking of the questions and men were doing the ones writing the books. And guess what they didn't write about? 
women <laughs> and they didn't ask questions about women or what women did or they made assumptions um and sort of dismissed the presence of women in the past and it wasn't really until uh women became really active in the field that a lot of that began to change and so much of what we think of things that we do here at Montpelier are really credited to some of the earliest women archaeologists um one is uh women were often uh, regulated to the lab. So uh, that was considered the, the place for them to be. So by having our lab as an open space and pushing that more to the forefront, that is sort of building on the backs of, of the women that did the, the lab work in the early days. One of the other things is women were some of the first people to do local archeology span and archeology span um, kind of in their own backyard, in their neighborhoods. And that was because in the early days, many women were not allowed to travel abroad to do their excavations. So they were prohibited by their universities. They were prohibited by the senior male archeologists from doing that type of work. So they only had access to sites um, nearby. And so that really drove a lot of the archeology span being conducted in, in the United States and sort of this more um, kind of think locally about your archeology. span and I think those are things that are really important um, for kind of the foundation that we're building here, because so much of that local archaeology is the backbone of public archaeology. Um, for most people, the archaeological sites that they see are the ones that are closest to them. Um, so this is just a really great book that kind of highlights um, women through time and the contributions that they've made to archaeology. This was a, uh, I first got this book when I was um, an undergraduate. Um, and had decided that archaeology was going to be my career path, and it was a gift from my mother. Um, and it really kind of gave me a, a good understanding of, of what I was getting into, and it prepared me for when I went to graduate school. Um, I'll give you sort of a, a side personal story. My advisor in my master's program was a woman, and my advisor as an undergrad was a man, and the male professor in my undergraduate, when he was an undergraduate, uh, he had been a student under my female advisor in my master's program because when she was working on her PhD, she was required by her professor to spend the entire work, week working on the PhD projects and excavations of her male um, colleagues, so the male PhD students. And she was only allowed to work on her own dissertation site on the weekends, and she was only allowed to have one undergraduate student work with her while the male students were allowed to have full field schools, full crews. And that one male student she had uh, ended up being my professor and he ended up being the one that sent me to go work with her for my master's. Um, but understanding that sort of background also under helped me understand why she was so really hard on us <laughs> because she knew what it had been like and um, the struggle that she'd experienced being in archeology span in the 1960s um, and the discrimination she faced, and she wanted to make sure that her um, female students were, were prepared for that. Um, but there's sort of a new version of, of this book that I love, and it's an Instagram site, and it's uh, run by uh, uh, a young woman who is an archaeology student, and her Instagram site is called Women in Archaeology. Um, it's a really, really great Instagram site. She has actually featured Taylor, um, myself, Hannah, Kiana, several of the other um, archaeology interns here at Montpelier and staff members. And basically what she does is she uses this platform to highlight women at all different levels all over the world that are doing archaeology. And it's just a really cool way to see what projects are happening around the world and how people are asking me different questions. So if you're on Instagram, um, uh, follow uh, uh, this site. It's just really neat. Um, actually, the woman you'll see, you see in the bottom left there is uh, Whitney Battle Baptiste, who I'm going to talk about her book as a primary influence on me. So <laughs> it just happened to be a coincidence. Um, so for each one of these resources that I'm going to share with you, I'm going to tell you how they help us understand Montpelier better. So what these two resources helped me do was figure out that the presence of women in archaeology allows us to ask new questions and make new identifications. And I think that that's really important um, because the experience and sort of the knowledge that, that many of these, these women archaeologists have brought to us have changed some things. And so the object you see on the left there um, is uh, an, actually a fragment of a garter clip. So these were 
garter clips um, from the 20th century that were recovered from the Gilmore cabin. Um, when I first arrived here, uh, they were labeled as suspender clips. So given that sort of male um, association with them. And it was when, uh, uh, not myself, I'm not taking credit for this. Uh, <laughs> Matt's waving. So he, he's waving as, um, he's the one that uh, uh, identified them as suspender clips. But I misidentified them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna say, I'm not taking credit for correcting the identification because it was actually another female archeologist that came to visit she pulled open the drawer and says, those aren't suspender clips, those are garter clips. Let me send you some pictures. And she was 100% right. And so I think it's really important for things like that. Um, sometimes stuff as personal as undergarments are things that um, other folks aren't, aren't aware of. Uh, this other one is another object from the Gilmore cabin. It's a little uh, um, kind of token that would have been a charm. On one side, it says, good luck to you. On the reverse side, it has a four leaf Mary, you froze for some it's reason. Powerful or something like that. Um, now you see my internet's unstable. Yeah, um, you froze up, but now you're good. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is part of a stick pin. So again, it was um, initially just identified as a charm, but it was through a little bit of research uh, that I did that I was able to identify, you know, what the whole object would have been and really be able to connect it to uh, an object that would have been most likely worn by. Um, one of the, the female members of the Gilmore family. So kind of taking it beyond just sort of this random charm that could have been used by anybody and, and making those, those new identifications or more specified identifications. Um, I think the other thing is to ask new questions because now all of a sudden we have questions. If you know someone's wearing garters, you have questions of, well, how does that affect how they move around? How does that affect how they do their work? How does, um, restrictive undergarments that women were required to wear affect their ability to do their jobs or move in space. And those are questions that you can't ask when you think it's a suspender clip. <laughs> so another one of my favorite resources, so this is sort of a, a, a fundamental book for me. Um, it is, I'm sorry the picture is so blurry, but this is Spanish St. Augustine, The Archaeology of a Colonial Creole Community by uh, Kathy Deegan. And the reason this book is so fundamental to me, I don't recommend buying it because it's so expensive because it's out of print, but check out your local library, <laughs> see if they have one that you can get. Um, the reason this book is so fundamental to me is it had such an impact on um, how people understood um, women in the Spanish colonial world. And sort of my background prior to Montpelier was in doing a lot of Spanish colonial work. And basically what Kathy argues is that women had control over the domestic space and that men had control of sort of the, the, the exterior spaces, um, the political atmospheres. And this was really important in the Spanish colonies because in the areas she was looking at, the majority of the women were indigenous and the majority of the men were um, uh, European. And so we were seeing the combination of um, cultures to create this new Creole culture where the women um, were bringing the knowledge of their indigenous cultures and those components mixed with um, what the men were bringing from Europeans. So kind of cooking techniques, uh, food combinations, those things really contributed um, from, from the women while uh, outside architecture con contributed from the men from sort of this European background. So um, this book was written in 1983 so it was pretty revolutionary for the time. Um, and it really had a big impact on a lot of people. Um, the, eight, the 80s was a, was a good time for sort of the beginning of um, feminist archeology span or just kind of asking questions about women in archeology. span um, So how does this affect us? What do we care about the Spanish colonies? Well, I think how it affects how I understand Montpelier is it has me look at different spaces in the house and who had control over them. So we think about, I pulled this picture of the dining room and how reading at really, this, is, this is a space um, that Dolly Madison had control over. She had control over what it looked like. She had control over um, the plates that people ate off of. She had control over the food that was served. This is really a space where she is um, showing herself and showing her power, showing her knowledge, 
her refinement, her knowledge of the world, her personal style, her personal taste, all of these things are sort of being displayed in, in this space. Um, so I think it's really interesting when you start thinking about, okay, well, who has control over the dining room? And then you kind of tease that out a little further. Well, who has control over the kitchen? So in many ways, Dolly has control over the kitchen, but in many ways, the enslaved women who are doing the cooking have the ultimate control over the kitchen. So kind of thinking about these different places where women are sort of seizing control and having the ability to be the decision makers um, of, of what is happening. So this book is, I would say, <laughs> um, anyone who, who is ever going to ask a, qu a question about a woman ever having to do with archaeology, you have to read this book. And this is one of the few books that's been written by an academic that's actually like a joy to read. <laughs> um, it is beautifully written, it flows, it is really a story. And so what this all means, um, Feminist Archaeology uh, by Janet Spector, what she does in this book is really taking um, artifacts and creating a fully rounded story of, of who the person would have been that would have owned or used these, um, these material items. So she focuses in on an all, but uses additional archeological archeolo information to round it out. And, and when I say a story, I truly mean a story. Um, archeologists generally tend to write very technically. Um, and what Janet Spector has done is, is write in a much more storytelling fashion. So using, um, uh, a full range of, of archeological and factual information, but also the importance and sort of the humanity of storytelling. Um, so I think how this helps us understand Montpelier and what we can sort of draw from this book is that when we talk about artifacts, we have to remember that we are both creating and telling stories, um, that there is interpretation to all of these pieces. So, Many of you have heard me talk about this ring many times, the carnelian ring. You know, we can um, dictate that we had a hardness test on it and verified that it was carnelian and parts of the world that it came from and double checking against oral histories. But when you say all that information very factually, um, you know, people go, oh yeah, that's nice. But when you tell the story of Imagine the experience of being an enslaved woman and having this on your finger when you are taken from your country and then passing it down through the generations and you tell this very personal story and bring the humanity into it. I think particularly for a place like Montpelier where our goal is to educate the public generally, I think it becomes really important because what we all connect to is sort of the humanity and the individual stories rather than um, whether uh, this passed the hardness test to be considered carnelian or imitation carnelian. Um, so I think storytelling is, is a huge component of it. And I think what Janet Spector did is really gave us the freedom um, to, to do that and not be um, stuck in just talking about soil volumes and um, manufacture dates. Um, one of the other uh, books, and for those of you who are on Stefan's talk uh, last week, this is certainly one he referenced, but this is a pivotal one for, for many of us, is Whitney Battle Baptiste Black Feminist Archaeology. Um, it is exactly what it says it is. There are many things about this book that are really wonderful for comparison uh, to Montpelier, including her, her really in-depth analysis of Andrew Jackson's Hermitage Plantation. But I think sort of the, the big draw from this book is, is she really emphasizes the importance of intersectionality. So Stefan talked about intersectionality um, a little bit last time, but if you weren't on that, I think um, basically intersectionality is, is saying, we can't just look at the experience um, in one dimension of a person's identity. So you can't just assume that all women are the same because you have to make considerations for age and status and race and, um, uh, economic ability and education on all of these things, all of these components that affect a person's lived experience. And when I was trying to figure out a picture for this, I went through a couple and then I came across this picture of one of the members of our descendant community, uh, Leontini, holding in her hands uh, the fragment of a slave shackle. And I think that this is a really sort of important thing to think about because I think for a, a lot of people, when they think about uh, an object like a shackle, they would not automatically assume that it could have been placed on a woman. Um, 
and I think that there is a tendency to point to objects as either those are things that women used or they're just other objects um, because sort of the default is male, um, but it doesn't have to be. But I think also sort of this idea of the intersectionality between race, um, your status as being enslaved or free, your gender, and what this with all means and how that can all be tied up into a particular artifact and who's looking at that artifact and why I think is, is really um, important, particularly when we think about shackles being used to transport people um, either to or from a place and, and the sort of connections that, uh, that that means sort of the implications for and particularly women um, and their roles in, as family members and particularly as mothers. Um, there's a lot of layers that can come into an artifact that way. Um, one of the things that I really realized I didn't want to do in this talk is put a bunch of pictures of objects up there and go, see, these are all women. Women equal thimbles. Thimbles equal women, because that's not true. Um, context matters, and we say this all the time, but an object doesn't equal identity. Um, it is the combination of the object itself, <laughs> everything it's around, and where it's located. So I pulled out these two examples. So on the right, that's uh, Dolly Madison's sewing kit. That is what her sewing kit looked like. On the left is a thimble, thimble recovered from the Gilmore cabin. But I always love to think about when thimbles or sewing objects are found on shipwrecks. Totally different context because you have to know how to sew if you're on a sailing ship. And often on sailing ships, there were no women unless they were as passengers. But if you have an all male crew that is responsible for that work, you also have to know how to sew because you got to fix your own clothes and do those things. So context, context, context is totally important to thinking about when you see an object, can you associate it with a particular um, gender? Can you associate it with a particular group of people? Um, and that the exact same object in a different context could totally represent somebody different. Um, so these are, are some of the, the ones that I kind of just wanted to touch base on and, and why some of them maybe present themselves um, sort of obviously and, and then some of them in kind of a different way. Um, on the top left, again, we have a thimble, but this is a child's thimble. So thinking about the intersectionality between age um, uh, gender. Also, this was recovered from the slave quarters, so race and status as well. The same for that, that porcelain doll foot, again, recovered from the slave quarters and that intersectionality between all of those different components. But I have them flanked, um, they're flanking in the center, a collection of uh, oyster shells and animal bones. And I think that's a really important thing to think about is, is food and diet and sort of the, the skills and knowledge of how to cook and prepare food, how to combine certain things, and this, this really vast array of knowledge. And so often now, and, and, and has been for several years, you know, the popularity of Southern cuisine, um, of, you know, soul food. And so often that's talked about as, you know, the, the influence of African-Americans on modern Southern <laughs> cuisine, but really kind of teasing into that more or of the importance of, um, African and African American women in really shaping the, the, the food that so many of us eat on a regular basis and consider to be kind of, you know, the food we identify with. Um, on the bottom right there, uh, the fragments of that cup taped together, I think are another really amazing example of, of sort of these, these um, connections to women, but also these different components of intersectionality. Um, that mug right there is a, is a child's mug, actually. Um, and it is uh, adorned with a transfer print that um, has a maxim from Ben Franklin. And it says, keep thy shop and thy shop will keep thee. And it's got an image on it of sort of a well-kept shop and business and one that's sort of fallen apart and so it has a closed um, sign on its door. And uh, one of the ways uh, in, in the past that women really exercised their um, ability to have influence was through their ability to educate their own children, but also uh, their ability to express their thoughts and opinions in the domestic atmosphere. 
So having your dishes sort of share your values or your political point of view was very common in um, the late 17 and in the 1800s when women didn't have the ability to vote or to often speak out politically. Um, so uh, we don't find any of these here, but you will find uh, particularly from uh, the first half of the 1800s, uh, abolitionist wear, so transfer printed ceramics that are adorned with images um, relating to uh, scenes from Uncle Tom's cabin or uh, other images sort of identified with abolitionism. Um, women would put those on their dining room table to kind of share with their guests, look, this is what I think and I am making my political statement. Um, uh, children's uh, uh, mugs and plates and dishes like this, this was a way for women to educate their children in, in sort of the values um, uh, and, and information they wanted them to have. Um, this mug itself was actually recovered from the field quarters. So I think that also adds another dimension to understanding, um, you know, what are the message that are being portrayed and how are women using um, everyday objects to kind of exert their influence. Some of the other things that, that, that you see here um, on the left are um, you know, thousands of tiny beads from the Gilmore cabin, sort of reflecting the work of the Gilmore women as seamstresses. And we see similar collections um, that it's often the, not the individual object, but the amount of an object can really tell you a lot of information, sort of leaning into that context idea. So at other sites, um, if you find lots and lots of buttons, it often indicates that they were doing laundry there because buttons were lost. So it's not about um, what the individuals who live there were wearing, but maybe they were taking in laundry from other people and using that for money. Um, so sort of the abundance of things. Uh, archaeologically speaking, an indication um, that you might be in a brothel is an abundance of perfume bottles. So really thinking about how it's not just the one object, but again, the context of how many there are is where they are, what's around them. Um, and then the two objects in the center, uh, the one on the left is a fragment of a decanter uh, set down against a picture of a whole uh, decanter with Madison provenance. So um, again, kind of controlling the entertainment space, controlling the domestic space, really having a lot of say. And we know through um, uh, you know, our, our tours here, our experiences here, that certainly Dolly Madison had a lot of power in that sphere and was able to have a lot of power politically through her ability to control sort of the entertainment and the domestic sphere on, on a national scale. Um, and so um, kind of maximizing those uses. And then next to that is, is a bone parasol top. And I always, whenever I look at that bone parasol top, I think of um, the reference to um, a visitor passing a group of enslaved women from Montpelier, um, enslaved people from Montpelier walking to church and a, a, a rain shower comes up and they all popped their parasols. Um, so finding that, that parasol fragment in the South Yard is just such a lovely um, connection to those stories. So again, thinking about how status, gender, race, all of these things come together. Um, and how I don't think it's really necessarily um, uh, the best thing to do is, is to say, well, we found this thing, so obviously there was a woman here. Um, but it is a really important thing to do to say, what would it look like if there was a woman here? What would we expect to see? What would we not expect to see? Um, what is a thing that's absolutely necessary so whether a woman's here or not, they would still need it? Um, and how do we look at something that generally we wouldn't assign a gender to, like, oyster shells and animal bones and look to see the influence of women on those objects and, and how we tell the stories about the past. And I think that's a, a really important thing. So I'm gonna, um, I see that some folks have some questions. So I'm gonna stop my little share for right now. Um, oh my gosh, I didn't know that Matt. <laughs> um, so, uh, Matt says in the comments, I uh, ha have to give a shout out to Mary Beaudry who passed away last night. So Mary Beaudry is one of the um, most well-respected women in archaeology who really explored identity and discovering women. And she is uh, actually in that women in archaeology book that I started with. She writes the chapter about what 
um, understanding women in historical archaeology is. That is her chapter. She is sort of the, the voice of that. So that is um, uh, really amazing and very sad to see. Um, she's, she's, Mary was sick for, has been sick for quite a while, but I think her passing was a little unexpected for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So very very nice lecture for you to give on this day, Mary. And <laughs> yeah, it's uh, um, weirdly appropriate. Um, and also my happiest memory of Mary Beaudry is also she had won an award at our uh, archaeology conference and she was so happy and having so much fun on the dance floor. She fully body checked me across the, <laughs> across the dance floor. <laughs> um, we get a little wild. <laughs> um, Oh, uh, Vicky asks, what did the other side of the charm say? I was frozen when I mentioned it. So on one side, it says good luck. And on the other side, it has a four leaf clover um, on the other side. So I wanted to kind of um, open it up to see if anybody had questions or ideas. I also have the cabinets behind me. Um, I can pull out any objects that people are particularly interested in or looking in. Um, but I wanted this to kind of be an opportunity to be less um, scratch it, look at this is what, what uh, I see and more kind of a way for us to think about maybe some of the objects that we've um, not thought too much about in the past um, and how we could think about them in a new way or have questions about them. Anybody have any questions? On the spot. Mary, I have a question. Um, do we have any idea in terms of the number of the percentage of people starting in archaeology, male to female, I know when I started in archaeology in the early 70s, it was like 90% men and a few women. Um, but what, do you know what the breakdown is now? Have any idea? Yeah, so there are more women um, getting degrees in archaeology now than men. So um, there are more women that get bachelor's and master's degrees than men. I think it's about 60-40. Um, there are still more men that get PhDs. Um, uh, there are still more men that publish uh, for, for various reasons, um, but the balance has started to really kind of even out um, much more evenly. I think um, generally speaking, you will still tend to find more women in museums, labs, curatorial spaces, um, but that is also evening out quite a bit. Um, the sort of, you also are now seeing more than ever before, women that travel abroad to do field work, women that are primarily field technicians or, or spend the majority of the time in the field. So you are seeing, because you're seeing more women in general, you're seeing more women in every component of the discipline. Um, and there is some additional kind of breakdowns. Um, generally speaking, there are more women in historical archeology span than prehistorical archeology. span uh, there are more men in maritime archaeology and underwater archaeology than women. Um, there are more men that tend to do sort of the geophysical archaeology. Um, any of the things that kind of lend more to the hard sciences tend to be more men. But a lot of that has, even since I've started, um, which is longer ago than I like to admit, it has definitely um, uh, gotten much more close to, to, being, to being even um, than it is our, um, ever has been before. Um, and I think it's really changed so much about the discipline itself. It's changed, um, like I said, it's changed the desire to do more locally based stuff. Um, there is a big movement um, in the discipline also to <laughs> stop digging. <laughs> um, and that sounds sort of strange, but that there's this huge amount of um, information that are in collections and to look at collections in new ways and to kind of rediscover that. Um, so there is, there is a lot of efforts um, to, to do that kind of work. And um, there's also a lot of efforts to make spaces um, not only more accessible uh, to women, but also uh, more inviting. So I can think about things. So my original field school, uh, we didn't have a bathroom. And uh, that was very common. And, and I remember thinking like the first time I, I went to a site that had a bathroom, which was when I went from working under male professors to other female professors, um, I was like, oh, these babies with their bathrooms, they're so spoiled. 
they have a toilet. Um, but it's truly, you know, it is, it is something that I, during my first field school, would just hold it all day because not only did we not have a bathroom, we didn't have woods. We were in a cotton field. So you either had to scrunch down to pull your pants off or you held it. And that's not good for anybody. <laughs> and so there are a lot of these things where for so long it was, yeah, you can come, but you have to be one of the guys. You have to be able to roll with it. You have to be able to be just as strong, just as tough, just as everything in order to be taken seriously. And I think now we're at the point where instead of being everybody has to prove themselves to be so tough, we're at the point of going, well, maybe everyone just wants a bathroom. Like maybe this is okay. Maybe just because you can pee standing up doesn't mean that you want to do it in the middle of a cotton field. <laughs> uh, um, so, in, and that's a very sort of crass example, but it's a hugely important example. And I think it also, particularly in this time period where, you know, we look at gender as being a much more inclusive spectrum than just the two biological sexes where bathroom issues can become quite complicated for a lot of people. And the inability to have any sort of privacy to, to experience that can be really difficult for people with medical conditions, for maybe a different gender identities, for all of those kinds of things can, can be enormously complicated. Um, I think the other things that, you know, we see a big change in the field was it used to be well, you can be an archeologist, but you can't be a mother and an archeologist. And I think one of the things that I've personally noticed um, in the past couple of years is a big shift of people going, no, 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 no. And the, the Society for Historical Archeology, span one of the things they have started doing is having um, an accessibility uh, uh, chairperson as part of our annual conference committee. And one of the things that person does is make sure that there is, uh, is information about daycare for women that maybe are traveling to the conference with children or spaces to um, uh, pump. Uh, <laughs> so these kinds of things. So thinking about having people in these positions that are asking these questions that are on leadership that the current president of the Society of Historical Archaeology is women, but having women in these leadership positions is really changing how archaeology is being done um, in the basic ways, but it's also changing the questions that are asked. It's changing the approach, it's changing um, sort of the considerations. Um, so we've got some other questions here. Uh, so Vicki asks if I have some objects, which I didn't include in my presentation, I can show us, I have a lot. Um, <laughs> I'll see what I can pull. And all right, so Mark asks, what is the indication that women handle money in daily life? Well, I think that all depends on your status. Certainly at Montpelier, um, enslaved women would have been handling money as they're going to markets and selling their goods, um, selling eggs, selling vegetables that they raise, things like that. Um, while, you know, kind of handling of the physical money, uh, literally handling physical money would have been something primarily that members of the enslaved community did. Um, for handling sort of money on sort of the big scale, sort of more plantation management, I think Matt's going to get into quite a bit of that next week when he talks about Francis, um, uh, sort of the, the business of the plantation and managing the money that way. Um, certainly that is something we see quite a bit with Francis Madison in a way that we don't necessarily see with, with some of the other uh, women on the plantation. Is that a fair thing to say, Matt? You're going to talk about that next week? Great. Um, and Elise asks, oh, hi, Elise. <laughs> um, are we seeing an increase in people of color into the field? Yes, um, we are at some level seeing an increase, but it's still uh, uh, not as many uh, as, as I think many of us would hope for. Um, there is an amazing organization called the Society for Black Archaeologists that is really um, not only providing, you know, excellent content. Um, one of the things that they recently provided was uh, one of the board members uh, was a, an amazing reading list for understanding the Tulsa race massacre. So amazing archeological and historical work, but they also provide a support network for um, African-Americans in the field, not just African-Americans, but black archeologists because it is an international organization, um, but also uh, providing opportunities for 
budding Black archaeologists to join uh, the discipline. So programs in St. Croix, programs uh, like Diving with a Purpose to help um, uh, young folks get into underwater archaeology. So really kind of coming about it in a lot of different directions. And there's other organizations. So for example, Montpelier, we, um, we provide a, a scholarship uh, every year for um, uh, African-American students looking to get a field school experience. Um, and we have had uh, different years, we've had different numbers of students, just depending on how many apply and how many qualify. But I think um, we had uh, four students, not this past year, but the year before. Um, and we've done it for now through three or four years now and have, have had uh, almost, uh, almost 10 students come through uh, through the scholarship program. Um, let's see, all right, I can pull some things for you. Um, so I think generally speaking uh, in archeology, span when we tend to look to find individuals, we look towards small finds. Those are the things we can connect to people um, on a very personal level, I think. Uh, so things like the garter clips. Um, so, excuse me for just a second. I'm gonna reach over here. Pull out. Um, I showed you one little doll leg, but these are two porcelain doll feet that are part of a matching set. Again, these are recovered from the South Yard. Um, these would have been part of a uh, soft bodied, cloth bodied doll with porcelain arms and legs. Um, and they uh, would have been at some point owned by an enslaved child, um, most likely a, a, a young girl um, as a way to uh, train her to care for and serve um, her, her mistress. So let me give you this expensive white imported doll um, so you can practice taking care of an adult woman. Um, so even something like this, where the location um, of it uh, indicates that it's associated with a member of the enslaved community, that it's a doll. So for that time, dolls would have been primarily played with by girls, um, young girls, uh, understanding the uh, importance of status and slavery um, is, is key to understanding what a doll like this means. Um, that it doesn't just mean like, oh my gosh, she has this sweet doll. Um, and also that it's an adult woman versus a baby of where are you putting the emphasis of, of the skills that she learns or practices to, of, of who to care for. Um, Wendy, are you raising your hand or are you just holding up your cast? Oh, you froze. No, I just have to have it elevated. So sorry, I'm not raising my hand. If I raise my hand, I'll use this one. <laughs> Mary, I think you locked up again. But yeah, Mary, really appreciate you. Um, you're uh, you know, moving beyond just the, like what a lot of people think of it is gender and just the gender assignments to artifacts, which is so misleading. It's, uh, um, but bringing gender in as a question and having, having uh, women involved in archaeology is such a critical part of this. It's in many ways like having descendants involved in our work. It's having, it, it, it brings about questions that we never would have even thought of. And in fact, I was, I was just talking with uh, Cindy the other day and Cindy Roche, and we were talking about the, um, about the, uh, the um, brick mosaic up in the South Yard. And she was mentioning it as, you know, the, the mosaic of the, of the young girl. And I was like, no, it's a young boy. And she was like, does it have to be a boy? And I was like, oh my God, you're right. That's, you know, my bias just coming because boys and girls are probably, are absolutely making bricks. And, you know, it's all in your perspective and to have, you have to ask, need to be present to ask this question. So it's really important. I think that's a really, um, that actually kind of leads really well. One of the other ones I wanted to kind of just mention were um, pipes. So there's sort of an assumption that women didn't smoke um, and, and particularly that they didn't smoke pipes because we assume that maybe that was unladylike, but um, certainly archeologically we find pipes. But one of the other things that's been found through biological anthropology is that signature dent <laughs> I'm looking at you, John Douglas, <laughs> um, in your teeth. <laughs> Sorry, you just set me up 
perfectly with the pipe in your mouth. Um, but the, there's a dent from where that pipe is always held. And you can see that in the skeletal records. And that was something that they have found doing um, uh, um, archaeology of sort of the, uh, the, the 18th uh, century. So I think that's a really interesting thing, you know, when we do things like when we find the Liberty pipe and we talk about it, or we find the Masonic pipe and we talk about it, I think there's such a tendency to people to assume that, oh, of course that was owned by a man. I mean, obviously the first assumption whenever we found the Masonic pipe was, well, I didn't know Madison was a Mason. And we go, he wasn't. And this wasn't found in his trash. This was found in the trash of the enslaved community. So how about instead of just there's an enslaved person smoking it, there's an enslaved woman smoking that pipe. And what does that say in sort of the layers of and sort of liberty being denied to someone? Um, speaking of, we've got a question. It says, um, in many fields in academia, there are often dominant standard theories in the profession that seem to preclude other ways of thinking. Do you find or have you found that this has been an interface for women progressing in the field of archeology? span I think, yes. <laughs> um, but I think there's a whole lot of women that did a whole lot of work um, before me to overcome a lot of that. So really starting in, in particularly in the 1980s, um, let go back a little further. In the 1960s and 70s, you have a movement called the processual movement in archeology. span And that really um, focused on kind of leaning into uh, what they called middle range theory or the ability to kind of get really sciencey about it. We're gonna be unbiased and we're gonna use science. Um, and there was a, a gentleman that really led that movement was a guy by the name of Lewis Benford. And then in the eighties, you have sort of the pushback in the eighties into the early nineties of what's called post-processualism. When a lot of people said, well, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can't know just from your statistics and your facts and figures. Statistical analysis aren't going to tell you about everything about humans and we're studying humans. And in that same time period, you have sort of the growth of, of people really, um, uh, sort of the growth of feminist archaeology, sort of the growth of the exploration of, of um, issues of race and identity really coming out of the 80s and 90s. And then that sort of all built up to say when I was in school in, in, the, in the early aughts, I had professors from both camps. And so I feel like my generation was constantly going from one class led by a very strong professionalist to another class led to a very strong post-professionalist. So we've sort of swung like this and then went sort of towards the middle <laughs> of we're gonna take the best of both worlds. And then we're gonna start looking towards the public and we're gonna kind of draw on all of that. Um, and I think that's sort of the direction. And I think what that has, done is that um, the work of those women, um, particularly in the in the 80s and the early 90s, really opened so many doors for, for um, the, the new ways of thinking in the next generations um, and helped people progress in their careers and ask new questions. Um, um, so I think that that is just a really um, we have to sort of thank the foremothers of, of our field for, for that kind of work. And I, and I see here, it's, you know, working at this place has been really amazing because um, so often, you know, there's, I think, more men that work in an archaeology department now than ever before. <laughs> and there's like three of them. <laughs> um, so it's been a, a really amazing experience uh, to be surrounded by uh, young women, particularly of our interns and staff, as they're kind of progressing up in their careers and, and being that sort of next generation to ask new questions. Um, another question is, uh, oh, Republicans hold the pipe on the right side of the mouth, Democrats hold it on the left. Is there a gender difference? I don't know. I would have to, uh, but that would be amazing if there was. <laughs> um, do we have a few minutes left. Does anybody else have any other questions or maybe artifact they'd like to see? something they'd like to think about. So one thing that I also found really interesting um, that I touched on a little bit, so I'll grab one thing to show you all um, out of here. So there we go. This is a little bit of Chinese export porcelain, sort of a lovely little piece. 
And the reason um, uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this is um, I talked a little bit about on with the the Franklin Maxim's um, cup of of women using their dishes to uh, sort of share with other people what they think. But it was in many ways um, they used their dishes to sort of explore the world. Um, so these the sort of proponents of Chinese export porcelain or sort of exotic imagery that is then later produced on transfer prints, whether it's uh, chinoiseries or images of India or the Middle East, these kinds of areas. Um, uh, no, this is not Canton. <laughs> um, so that ability really got translated in many ways of women being able to kind of show their awareness of the world, but also, um, uh, to some, um, some material cultural historians have talked about how it was a form of escapism as well. So we think often about the bondage of slavery, but even incredibly high status women were still limited in their mobility, their political power, their financial ability, their ability to control their own finances. Everything was controlled, you know, by their husbands or their fathers. Um, or often uncles, sometimes even their sons. Um, and so really uh, kind of this idea of escapism, of imagining these very exotic places, these places that were quite different. Um, you sort of think about how sort of this embracing of um, these very different uh, images, what that kind of experience would have been like for, for women during a time when their mobility, their movement, their voices were, were incredibly controlled. Um, and I think that is a really interesting way to look at uh, the plate somebody chooses to put on their table um, uh, and the messages that they're trying to send uh, with, with the plates they put on the table, the paintings they hang on their walls, those types of things. So often when people come to Montpelier and they come into the, the main parlor with the red wallpaper, we talk about like, this is a rumor Madison is telling you who he is. He's got pictures of his friends, his influences, the games he likes. Look, I know about uh, electricity. Here's my little thing over here. Look, I know about um, pagan religions. I know about Christianity. It's all on the walls. It's all surrounding you. Madison's telling you, this is who I am. Well, the women, Dolly is doing the same thing. Nellie, his mother, is doing the same thing in her spaces where they're using their spaces and their material or objects to tell you who they are, um, what their dreams are, what their ideas are are, what their personal tastes are. And I sort of love this idea that maybe one of the things that some women could be telling us is that they fantasize about getting the heck out of there. And I just think that's a really just neat way to think about um, something different. Let's see. Am I still frozen or am I unfrozen? Unfrozen. So, okay. Um, so Susan asks, do I have a favorite artifact uh, that still throws you each time you see it? I mean, for me, it is, it's, it's the carnelian ring um, that always gets me excited. It's the one that, that I feel just is, is so personal and, and has that amazing connection between um, uh, Africa and, uh, um, and, and Virginia. And also I, the, the idea of the story, the experience of being that, that woman that wore that ring that woman that inherited that ring, that woman that lost that ring. It's just so, so personal to me. And anytime I, I can get really personal with something, um, I think that that hits me in a, in a particular way. But I also get really excited when um, there's new sort of discoveries um, and new ways of looking at, um, at these objects. So I'm really excited to start cataloging the stuff from the overseers site because right now a big black hole in our knowledge is the wives of the overseers. Um, we've started to identify the names of some of the, the overseers, but really understanding, you know, were their wives there? Were they on site? Were their children there? What was their job? What was that experience to be like? Are you considered an employee of the Madisons? Are you not? There's, you know, one reference in the documents of, um, of you know, Madison wanting the overseer's wife to, to, to spin cloth for him and her saying no. Oh, you have the power to say no? Like, this is a fascinating thing for me of, of how, how 
these women are going to kind of fit into this puzzle and how are we going to see that and how are we going to figure that out. So I'm really hoping that that'll start to come up in, in some of the objects. Um, okay, so Mim says, tell us the story of unearthing the ring. I'll grab it and we'll talk about it. Haha, <laughs> I'm really glad I decided to sit here. <laughs> um, so this is the carnelian ring itself. Um, we uh, uh, discovered this ring during the excavations of the building that was identified as um, sort of the planter's cottage, Madison's boyhood home. Um, but also by the early 19th century, it was a slave quarter that also had a kitchen and that kitchen um, primarily was to, to serve Nellie Madison, James Madison's mother. Um, when this ring was first discovered in 2016, uh, we didn't know what it was. <laughs> it got sent down to the lab. Yeah. We banged it against our teeth. We bit into it and, and nobody had ever seen anything like it before. Um, so it wasn't actually until we were photo, one of our volunteers, uh, Larry Boudery was photoing the ring when um, he said, I, I, I don't think this is what you guys think it is. And so he went and got Matt and Matt goes, what? Is, and he goes, Matt, what is this? And Matt goes, ah! <laughs> um, and he freaked out in, in the best possible way. And he said, oh my God, this is Carnelian. And we all looked at him and we're like, what's Carnelian? Um, and he started telling us about when he was working in Jamaica about 30 years ago and having seen a carnelian bead um, and how all of the carnelian material that he had ever seen archeologically um, had been associated with people of African descent, um, had been in the form of beads and uh, was um, primarily associated with burials. So we started doing some poking around and really that was the evidence that carnelian in North America and in the Caribbean was just such a rare find um, archeologically. And when it was found, it was, it was usually in these um, uh, enslaved African or African American contexts um, and usually beads. So all of those things sort of go, oh, this is, this is really unique. This is really rare. Um, and then we started to think about, well, how would a ring like this get here? Um, so, we knew this wouldn't be a thing that would be widely available on the market because it is so rare. So not something available to be purchased like the ceramics, like the, the transfer prints, like the buttons or even something like the Masonic pipe. Um, this was much, much rarer than that. Um, so we started to sort of kind of put together this story of what was the trade networks for Carnelian? Where does it come from? It comes from the Middle East, it comes from India and it was heavily traded um, uh, across the Indian Ocean into East Africa, um, but not traded into the Americas, really. So um, that allowed us to go, okay, so if it came here, is it possible that it came here on the body of an enslaved person? Were they wearing this ring when they were taken, when they were taken um, from Africa and brought here? And, um, when we started to make this consideration, we looked towards, do we have examples of this happening at other sites? And one of the um, examples we turned to was at Manassas um, in the excavations of a quarter and kitchen there, a ring made of ebony, um, which uh, was discovered in that kitchen area, which is again, another African material. So we have an example um, of this happening of sort of these maybe not, not sort of precious metals or overly expensive sort of personal items making it that journey across um, and then to be deposited in a very uh, similar location contextually. So when we looked at where it came from out of, of the structure, it came from the context of that, that later, that um, early 19th century occupation when it was a quarter in a kitchen. And so all of these pieces started to sort of line up and indicate that it came from Africa. And then we started to sort of share this with um, members of the descendant community. Um, and um, one of the members of the descendant community, Betty Kearse, whose, whose book has just come out, um, has just won a major award actually. <laughs> um, uh, she shared with us, um, and she is a descendant of women who were enslaved cooks here at Montpelier that in her family history, they have a, a, a history of a red bead being passed down through the family that was brought from Africa. And when you look at this ring, it has this sort of reddish, orangish color to it. So the story of it, uh, 
the bead and her family just was so similar to the story we were constructing um, of this ring, of its journey, of its experience here. And then we started thinking about, well, how did it get up in this, the record? And all I could think about was every time um, you're in a kitchen and you take your ring off because it's so important to you and you put it in that little dish by the windowsill or you set it next to the sink because you wanna keep it safe because you're putting your hands in dough or you're putting your hands in meat and you're getting all into it. And then you turn around and it's not there because it's been knocked away or lost. And that experience is something that, you know, when we started kind of putting the story together and I would talk to visitors about it every single time, if there was a large group of people, at one point, someone, usually a woman would go, oh yes, I've done that. Or a husband would go, she did that or something like that. It was just such this universal experience of that feeling of loss, that feeling of I'm trying to keep this thing protected and safe and then I lost it. Um, so kind of putting, putting our, our, ourselves in the shoes of the person that would have worn this, who would have probably inherited, it probably would have been passed down from her mother or maybe her grandmother and then to have lost it. And, and sort of that, that loss and that experience. And when you think about um, being taken from your home, taken from your religion, taken from your language, taken from your family, and then that trauma and that loss does get passed down through the generations. But if you had something like this ring to have that connection, that physical connection to that place that you know you may never see, that your grandchildren will never see, it is such a powerful, powerful thing. And I think that's the power of these artifacts to really tell stories that are um, that kind of connect us through our, our, our shared humanity. Um, I think objects like this ring are, are so powerful in their ability to kind of take the experiences that we have that feel so familiar and, and be able to connect them to people in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, that's why the ring always gets me so excited because it feels so incredibly personal, but it also connects us through time and it connects us across the world because the material itself comes from the Middle East or, or, or India. It traveled across the ocean, across Africa. It traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to get to the Americas, to get all the way out to orange, to be passed through the generations, to be lost and to be rediscovered. And, and very often you feel very separate. I think many of us in 2020 feel very separate from other people and feel se separate from the world because of um, you know, quarantines or, or stay-at-home orders. And it's so amazing to think about that connection um, through, through a little object that connect us to um, women you know, from hundreds of years ago, but also um, to connect us to the whole world. All right, well, that's all I got. <laughs> um, uh, so I just wanna thank everybody for, for joining us today. Um, this was really fun for me to kind of think about doing a talk in a little bit of a different way. Um, and, you know, I hope um, all of you kind of, when you come back on a dig with us, when you come back to the lab again, you know, just look at the things and start asking different questions and, and trust your own experiences um, and your own lives to, to, to guide you in those ways. And I think it's, it's just so powerful when um, people can share their experiences with us and help us ask new questions and, and make new identifications and, and think about things in, an, in a new way. Until next Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Bye. Bye, everybody. Have a good day.